to renounce samsaric minds, first we should not have the slightest attachment to samsara. We need to cultivate this. You have to know that nothing in samsara is worth our attachment. Additionally, it's crucial to know that attachment leads to suffering. As long as you have an attachment, you will suffer, and eventually the suffering will become unbearable. Moreover, attachments will continuously grow. If an attachment arises but you don't stop it, you will become more and more trapped. In the end, you cannot free yourself from it and will inevitably fall into hell, suffering immensely. Each of us has experienced this suffering, but many have forgotten it. On the level of understanding, the top priority is to meditate on suffering. In Buddhism, suffering is the foundation of liberation. It's essential to earnestly study the suffering of samsara. If you haven't generated renunciation, I encourage you to carefully study our courses on the path for practitioners of medium capacity and all contaminated things are suffering. Some people are intelligent. They can quickly grasp profound teachings but won't engage in actual practice. Why? Because they haven't experienced suffering. So they won't be diligent. They won't engage in actual practice. Instead, they only study Buddhism as a philosophy or a hobby. If you advise them to engage in actual practice, they won't be interested. They won't be diligent like extinguishing a fire on their heads. They are ignorant of the immense suffering that awaits them. Since beginningless time, the various afflictions and karmic habits of greed, anger and ignorance we have nurtured have been attempting to dominate us. In fact, we are all controlled by greed, anger and ignorance. Every thought or intention that arises in us is driven by the karma of greed, anger, ignorance, doubt and arrogance. We should use the power of precepts to prevent these afflictions from arising. By observing the precepts, we can also prevent afflictions from arising. Concentration means focusing the mind on a specific state or object. For example, by counting breaths or meditating on impurity, we can concentrate the mind on the breath or impurity, thereby preventing afflictions and delusions from arising. Then, by meditating on impermanence and non-self, we can cultivate wisdom free from defilements, thereby eradicating afflictions and attachments. Therefore, after generating renunciation, we should understand how to maintain it and make it continuously grow until we attain the ultimate enlightenment. Otherwise, even if one generates renunciation, it will soon be replaced by the samsaric mind. The author's point is that if you generate renunciation but don't keep cultivating it, you will easily forget and lose it because the karma of the samsaric mind accumulated over countless kalpas is too strong. When we generate a strong renunciation, the samsaric mind will lie low temporarily. The samsaric mind is very cunning. It can temporarily retreat. However, once we slack off a little, it will resurface immediately. I feel deeply that, as spiritual practitioners, we must be as diligent as warriors. Otherwise, it is hard to make a significant breakthrough. This is because the samsaric mind is too strong, like ice. During the day, you use something warm and bright to shine on the ice, hoping to melt it. After great effort, it melts a little bit. However, 
when the cold wind blows at night, it freezes again. This is how it is. As spiritual practitioners, we are also doing the silly thing every day. During the day, we use light to shine on the ice and melt it little by little. However, at night, when the cold wind blows, the ice becomes solid again. The next morning, it starts all over again. During the day, you struggle to shine your tiny ray of light on the ice again. Even if the winter sun shines all day, the ice won't melt much. After one night, it freezes again. In our spiritual journey, we practice in this manner life after life. Even though we have practiced for countless lifetimes, we remain the same because the samsaric mind is too strong. You should practice diligently and break through to a certain level so that the samsaric mind cannot recover. Only after transcending the samsaric mind can you undergo a qualitative change and reach a new stage. At this new stage, you should gradually strengthen your state and not regress. When you have strengthened at this stage for a certain period, you can accumulate more merits and advance to the next stage. You need to make progress step by step and make breakthroughs stage by stage. Once you reach a stage, you need to strengthen your progress. It's impossible to keep going up all the time. No one can do it. You need to accumulate. When you have accumulated enough energy, you can advance to the next stage. Diligent practice is like fighting enemies. After a battle, you need to rest. The soldiers and horses also need rest. You need to accumulate strength and prepare for the next battle. During a battle, you should devote yourself wholeheartedly. Similarly, when fighting the enemies of afflictions, you cannot fight for a while and then allow them to recover. Unlike ordinary enemies that diminish after being eliminated, the enemies of afflictions can multiply. Afflictions are like bacteria. If you haven't eradicated them, they will recover. They multiply rapidly. You should devote yourself wholeheartedly and seize the time to eliminate all afflictions. Only then can you take a break. After resting and strengthening yourself at that stage, you can eliminate the next group of enemies. There are various afflictions with different strengths. Therefore, spiritual practice requires actual action. Merely studying is ineffective. Studying strategies and tactics alone can only make you an armchair strategist. You can talk about it all day long. However, actual practice is more than that. To attain liberation from samsara, you need to engage in actual practice. If you don't diligently eliminate the samsaric mind in this way, it will easily arise again. Of course, mental diligence doesn't mean intense mental effort. Although intense mental effort is required in the beginning, what is more important is not to slack off. When you start practicing, you need to exert intense mental effort. It's not a good approach, but we have no other choice. For instance, if you have a strong addiction to drugs, then at the beginning you have to overcome it by force. Similarly, to avoid violating the precepts, you need to exert intense mental effort. However, as you progress, you cannot exert too much mental effort as it can lead to attachment. At that time, what you need to do is not slack off. If you exert too much mental effort for a long time, 
you will not only be prone to becoming tired, but also get caught up in mental activities. Therefore, the key is to know how to exert mental effort. Otherwise, if you work hard in the wrong way, you will encounter problems. Haste makes waste. Diligence doesn't mean exerting intense mental effort like worldly people. What we need to do is gradually eliminate the power of karma, but not fight it. In the beginning, fighting is necessary. Spiritual practice is akin to practicing Tai Chi, using a small force to overcome a greater force. We should weaken the power of afflictions or karma instead of directly fighting it. Initially, we can occasionally exert a little effort to fight it. You do need to exert a little effort. Without even a small force, how can you move a thousand pounds? You have to exert a little effort, but not directly fight it. What you need to do is unload and dissolve its power. We need to use wisdom to eliminate the power of afflictions. We should gradually weaken their power. We don't need to exert too much effort. Just eliminate their power. This is how we should practice. We cannot use worldly methods to practice the path to liberation. Worldly methods are about directly fighting. For example, if the opponent can lift 1,000 pounds, I shall lift 1,001 pounds to defeat him. Worldly methods don't work in the long run. What we use are methods that transcend the world. The ultimate goal of generating renunciation is to attain liberation from samsara and achieve supreme enlightenment through the Noble Eightfold Path. In today's society, it's challenging to practice as there are numerous temptations and distractions. Even for monastic practitioners, there are too many matters to attend to. Whether you are a monastic or lay practitioner, I hope you don't get involved in too many activities. In this aspect, please don't follow my example. Nowadays, I try to decline as many matters as possible, but sometimes I have no choice. You should focus on practicing the path to liberation and help sentient beings according to circumstances. I will pave the way for you so you don't need to do it. It's hard to pave the way while you just need to drive on the paved road, which is easy. Due to the interruption of the lineage of the Buddha's teachings, we have to pave the way now. That's why we are sometimes busy. This is the current situation. You should practice diligently now. After you have made progress in your practice, you can gradually guide others. In this way, you won't have much pressure. On one hand, don't get involved in too many activities. Otherwise, you won't make progress in your practice. On the other hand, it's not advisable to avoid all activities as we need to train our minds through various circumstances. Most novice practitioners are prone to be influenced by the environment. Hence, they have high requirements for the environment. In the past, most monastics lived a simple life in the mountains and forests, free from worldly distractions. Apart from the minimal necessities for sustaining their bodies, they devoted themselves wholeheartedly to spiritual practice. In comparison, the environment for spiritual practice today is really challenging, making it much more difficult to practice the path to liberation. Nowadays, it is hard to practice the path to liberation, but there are also advantages. People in the past could not experience the current circumstances. 
Nowadays, people experience more circumstances and suffering, making it easier to generate renunciation and see through the mundane world. Nowadays, the world is constantly changing. In the past, people didn't have the opportunity to see the world or know what it was like. However, nowadays, young people can easily see through the mundane world and realise that I've seen the world and that's it. I'm not interested in it anymore. This is the advantage of today. In the past, people regarded the emperor as mysterious. They believed the emperor was the son of heaven, as if he had descended from the heavens. However, nowadays, everyone knows that this is not the case. In ancient times, men didn't have the opportunity to see many women throughout their lives. But now, you can see women everywhere. The more you see, the more you will realise that women are also beings that constantly excrete various wastes. Thus, men can gradually stop fixating on women, making it easier to see through this attachment. In the past, this was indeed the case. Women used to wear many layers of clothing, covering their hands, feet and even faces. Hence, Woman seemed mysterious. If you want to see someone, the only way is to marry her. Nowadays, you can easily see women, even naked ones. In such circumstances, you will realise that nothing is fascinating. Hence, it's easy to see through it. Once you see through it, it's easy to let go of this attachment. Why was it easy for actors in the past to see through the mundane world? The reason is the same. Actors performed every day, and the more they performed, the more likely they wanted to renounce worldly life. Nowadays, it's easy to see through the mundane world, but hard to focus on spiritual practice. In ancient times, it was hard to see through the mundane world, but easy to focus on spiritual practice due to the absence of challenging circumstances. At that time, it was easy to dedicate oneself to spiritual practice because they were far away from worldly distractions. They spent their entire lives in the mountains and never saw a woman, so it was easy to practice. After death, they might be directly reborn in the pure land without knowing what women look like in their entire lives. Have you heard this story? A young monk who had never seen a woman asked an old monk, What is a woman? The old monk replied, A woman is a tiger. This was the case in ancient times. They lived in the mountains and had never seen a woman since they were young. In such circumstances, it was easy to focus on spiritual practice. So, in today's practice, we may need to use some sharp methods, that is, fast and effective methods that can immediately eliminate various afflictions. In Buddhist practice, there are such methods. They can help us quickly be free from attachments to notions, permanence and attainments, and maintain this state. In ancient times, practitioners would meditate for 10 or 20 years to achieve initial progress. However, modern people cannot practice in this way. If they don't make any progress after meditating for a year, they will give up. On one hand, it is hard to practice in the age of Dharma decline. On the other hand, it is easier to see through the mundane world in this era. If you are truly diligent, you can quickly achieve spiritual attainments. If you are truly dedicated to the right path, you will progress even faster than ancient practitioners because the conditions for meditation retreats are better now. 
In ancient times, it was hard to engage in meditation retreats. After building a hut and living in it for two years, a gust of wind might blow it down. This was indeed the case. You may not remember the past conditions, but I remember a bit. In the past, the conditions were very harsh. Building a hut was considered fortunate. Not to mention ancient times, even in the 1980s, the conditions were very tough. If one's spiritual practice is based on samsaric minds, then it is normal for such phenomena to occur. This is because the mindfulness we cultivate now is on the conscious level. How could it resist the afflictions and delusions formed since beginningless time, which are much stronger than it? It is like a baby fighting against a strong man, and the result is apparent. Recognising this law of the mind, we can easily understand why many people fail to achieve the expected results in their practice. Currently, we are cultivating mindfulness on the conscious level, and our daily study is also on the conscious level. Nevertheless, every time you instill your mind with mindfulness, you make progress. However, this is still on the conscious level, so it's not strong enough. Once we return to the mundane world, the afflictions and karma accumulated since beginning this time are powerful, just like a strong man. Our mindfulness, however, is like a baby. Their powers are immensely different. Why do we need to practice together? because the power of group practice is much stronger. It is hard to practice alone, as you are prone to generating afflictions. The demons are powerful and pervasive. They can easily defeat you in no time. In the monastic community, we support each other and diligently study and practice together. In the evenings, Everyone should listen to the Dharma teachings together. If you don't go to class, your karmic habits may drive you to watch movies, surf the internet, indulge in food and entertainment, or even get drunk and have conflicts with others. In a Dharma centre, at the very least, you won't engage in such worldly activities. By listening to the Dharma teachings here, you will gradually elevate. In the morning, during the day, and in the evening, you should listen to the Dharma teachings together and spend the remaining time on meditation. If you have extra time, you can work. However, you should treat work as a hobby and prioritize your spiritual practice. Some of you are lay practitioners. You can take advantage of your work to train and elevate yourselves. For example, you can cultivate bodhicitta in action, generosity and patience in your work. This way, you can integrate work as part of your spiritual practice. Don't treat spiritual practice as a hobby. For example, when you feel tired from work, you may think, I need a spiritual massage, and then turn to Buddhism. However, before your wounded soul is healed, you may suffer again. Then you might come back to me in tears, saying, Teacher, I am suffering. I feel uncomfortable or sick here and there. I am sad. Some even experience mental disorders. They only come to me when they are mentally ill because the suffering is immense. 